Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, first event of 2024 with the Royal Photographic Society's Historical Group and our series of collections talks. It's a pleasure this evening to hand over to the group's chair, Gilly Reid, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Gilly, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and it's nice to be back again. I haven't I have really registered this was our first talk, talk but of course it is. Uh, anyway... Nice to, that everybody has come, and I'm very pleased to introduce Victoria Miller, who is the senior curator at the History of History and Art at the National Museums of Northern Ireland, and she is going to tell us about um, Northern Ireland in days gone by. W. A. Green, who did seem to have done a very large amount of photography of round things, anyway. Victoria has been uh, in this particular curator, curation or curatorial job, I can't say things anymore, uh, for four years. And it, I'm very glad that she has decided to do the talk for us. I think it's going to be very interesting. So I'm not going to do much more now, but just say thank you very much to Victoria. And off we go. Over to you. OK, thanks very much, Gilly. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much um, for inviting me to speak uh, to you this evening about the WA Green Photographic Collection, um, which is held at the Ulster Folk Museum. Um, as Gilly mentioned, uh, my name is Victoria Miller and I'm a Senior Curator of History at National Museums NI. National Museums NI is made up of four museums in total. Uh, the Ulster Museum in Belfast, the Ulster Folk Museum and the Ulster Transport Museum at Coltraw, and the Ulster American Folk Park in Oma. My remit encompasses our two outdoor museum sites, the Ulster Folk Museum and the Ulster American Folk Park. The Ulster Folk Museum, where the WA Green Photographic Collection now resides, was formally established in 1958 with the passing of the Ulster Folk Museum Act, and it officially opened to the public in 1964. The years in between the passing of the Act and the opening of the museum was a very busy time. A location had to be found for the museum and a collection had to be established alongside a portfolio of exhibit buildings representing Ulster around the turn of the 20th century. When the museum opened in 1964, it had two buildings. Today we have over 50, split between the town and the rural area, which you can see on this map. The W.A. Green Photographic Collection came into the muse museum's possession in the early 1960s during this very busy time, and the acquisition couldn't have been more timely. The photographs provide a crucial record of life in Ulster in the same period that the museum was trying to recreate. The collection itself dates from around 1880 to 1940 and consists of approximately 4,000 glass plate negatives, original prints, lantern slides and published series of views. The collection contains material of topographical, archaeological, industrial and transport interest. However, it's particularly strong in regard to images of agriculture, rural life, crafts and pastimes of the north of Ireland. William Alfred Green, seen here in one of his photographs on the right, alongside his wife and son, was born into a Quaker family in Newry, County Down in 1870. He was the only child of Thomas Green and Eliza Nay Allen. Thomas's father, William, a farmer, was the eldest brother of Foster Green, a Belfast tea and grocery merchant. Thomas followed a similar path to his uncle Foster, establishing a tea and grocery business in Newry. William was a boarder at Friends School in Lisburn. The earliest photograph in the collection is from 1887, which suggests that William's passion for photography started in at least his teens. Having lost both his parents by the time he was 20, he was apprenticed to the grocery business of his granduncle Foster in Belfast. In 1897, he married Mary C. Shemmeld of Portadown, a Quaker and grandniece of Foster Green. Their son, Edmund Foster, was born in 1902. The family lived a comfortable lifestyle, the couple having both received inheritances from respective family members. 
William developed a keen interest in the Belfast Natural Spiel Club, which he joined in 1895, and later became a fellow of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland. It's commonly thought that a decline in William's health led him to leave the family business and become apprenticed to the professional photographer Robert John Welsh. The veracity of these claims has been debated. However, we can say with certainty that by the time of the 1911 census, William was working as a photographer's assistant. William had a close relationship with his son, who appears in many of his photographs. Indeed, it was not uncommon for the whole family to take excursions across the north of Ireland in their Ford Model T. And make sure to keep an eye out for it this evening as we go through some of his photographs. Tragically, William's son died in 1921. And in 1924, Ian Mary moved to Dunmore House in Antrim, which is thought to have been bequeathed to them by a family member. You can see here on this slide. Coincidentally, a descendant of William recently got in touch with me and shared some memories of his great uncle Bill, as he called him, and Dunmore House. He recounted, During the 1950s, on a Sunday afternoon, our family would often drive from our home in Lisburn to visit Aunt Mary and Uncle Bill in Dunmore. I remember a cluttered Edwardian sitting room on the first floor, full of stuffed birds, oriental looking vases and assorted Victoriana. Mostly us kids were told to go out and play with a battered croquet set on the front lawn. But once, when I must have been seven or eight, Uncle Bill took me into his study to look at his collection of bird's eggs, his collection of seashells, I still remember some of the names, and the flint arrowheads he had found. In his day, plundering archaeological sites or the nests of endangered species was not yet frowned upon. It was a suitable pastime for a gentleman. More acceptably nowadays, he had a massive stamp collection. This evening's talk is a variation of a talk I gave a few months ago to Antrim and District Historical Society. William took photographs all over Ulster, but for the purpose of this evening's talk, I focused on Antrim and the surrounding area, starting first with Antrim and then looking more widely. All of the collection, is available to view on our collections online portal on our website, details of which I'll provide at the end of the talk. So if you look here on this slide on the right hand side and um, the smaller uh, map image you'll see um, encompasses uh, Ulster and to the left you'll see um, the middle part of Ulster has Loch Ney in it and all the stars that you see, um, there's Antrim um, sort of at the top and then lots of uh, red stars dotted across uh, and around Antrim area and um, the lock. Those are the locations that we'll be um, taking a look at um, this evening. But as I say, he took photographs across Ulster. So if you're interested in seeing more photographs that he took, um, please do uh, look at uh, his collection on our website after this evening's talk. So let's uh, now start with Antrim. Most of Green's photographs include a short description at the bottom of the photograph, um, which you can see here, um, as well as usually a reference number beginning with his initials, WAG, um, followed by a sequential number. So you'll see here it says Riverside Antrim and then WAG um, 2114. Um, here we have a photograph of the Riverside in Antrim with All Saints Parish Church in the background. It isn't uncommon to find photographs um, of a similar view um, taken either at the same time or a different time. Um, here um, we've got a similar view of the river taken slightly farther away. Something I find interesting is um, taking a look on Google Maps um, to see what's changed and what stayed the same um, in some of um, the old photographs that we have in our collections. Um, this is an example of a similar view I was able to get from Google Maps of the previous two photographs. So um, sort of more from a social history perspective, it's interesting to see you know, what buildings are still there and what changes have occurred. Um, over the course of um, 100 or so years. Um, so that's something that's quite handy to do um, if you're not um, close to the particular area um, to see in person. 
Next, um, we've got a photograph of the Mazarine Hospital in Antrim, where William himself later became a patient um, in his older years. We can also see All Saints Parish Church in the background. It was originally built as a workhouse before becoming a hospital, and later then it was demolished to make way for a Tesco store. So there's been lots of change um, on this site um, over the years. All Saints Parish Church is also visible in this photograph of Church Street in Antrim. Um, the car you can see in this particular photograph, I believe, is um, Green's car, um, potentially maybe with his son behind the wheel. Um, in addition to Google Maps, um, I find the Historic Environment uh, Record of Northern Ireland's Buildings Database can be a useful source as well um, to ascertain uh, what buildings of historical significance are still on the street or have since been demolished. So again, looking at a historic photograph like this and comparing it and contrasting it with other sources um, can provide um, some very useful insights. Next, we have a photograph of the Antrim Bridge or Mazarine Bridge and um, the Six Mile Water uh, with a couple of boys um, posing on the top. Um, you can see them sort of dangling their legs over the edge. Um, if you do look as well to the very left hand side of this photograph, um, you can see a man um, looking out of the window, perhaps um, looking to see um, what Green was doing um, and watching them, um, the two boys um, posing for the photograph. Next, we have a few photographs of Fair Day in Antrim in Market Square. Um, with the old courthouse at the centre of this photograph. Um, a good thing about our Collections Online portal is that you're able to zoom in to all of these photographs um, on it. Um, so it's very interesting to zoom in and look at particular details. And I think I've done that um, in a few slides time to show you some examples of that. But even in, um, on this view, we can see things like cattle, stalls, bicycles, and even a sign saying Halls Hotel, um, the motor house. So all these um, bits of information can be really useful You know, if you're researching the history, for example, of Antrim, or maybe fair days in Ulster, or what people wore, uh, what people drove, and things like that. So they give us a really interesting account you know, of life in addition to you know, other sources that we hold. The next one here, we've got um, another view um, farther up High Street, um, we've got lots more cattle, some horses. Um, you can see the different types of dress that people have with various flat caps and bowler hats and things like that. Um, this one, um, from what I can see, looks very uh, largely a male scene um, with very few women in it. Um, we've got another uh, shot here. There's a, a few women in this one um, over towards the right hand side. Um, this one is entitled Hiring Fair. Um, and as the name says, um, fairs were often a time where people could uh, go in and um, hopefully secure a job. Um, so that was a common pastime that people did um, at certain times of the year, um, in addition to um, shopping and things like that. Um, in this particular photograph, you can see the Ulster Bank building um, just to the right hand side, the largest um, building in this particular photograph. Um, and again, that's um, of interest too in terms of the architecture of uh, bank buildings and comparing and contrasting them against other bank buildings across Ulster and things like that. Uh, next, we've got a few views of the Antrim Arms Hotel in High Street um, with the name of faucets above the door. Um, so this is an example of um, a series of shots that Green took of the same building. Um, at different angles. So here we can see sort of uh, this sort of angled shot on the left of the building. And then if I go to the next one, you'll see sort of face on um, of, of the building. Um, and next door um, in this particular view, we can see AE bars, stationery and fancy goods shop uh, being uh, included in this particular view. And then the next shot shows um, the uh, hotel from the right hand side. Um, and again, just interesting points of note there in terms of you know the signs outside um, the shop. 
um, the different uh, types of seating in front of the hotel, um, the vehicle on the road, as well as um, sort of even the condition of the road in terms of if there's any debris on the road and things like that um, can be quite interesting to to focus on and, and investigate further. So um, lots going on in this particular photograph. And what you can also do then, having sort of gathered a bit of information from a photograph, is then um, looking for further clues, maybe in newspapers and the like. So this is just an example then um, of an advertisement for the hotel um, in 1928. So probably around in and around the time that Green took um, that series of photographs. Um, usually um, it's uh, commonplace that Green didn't include the date on his photographs. I think there's another one coming up soon which shows the date, but um, usually we'll have to kind of guesstimate, you know, when exactly the photographs were taken, um, you know, early part of the 1900s. Sometimes you can be a bit more definite depending on what's happening in the particular scene. Um, but this uh, newspaper article um, is from 1928. And you can see there, there's an advertisement for the hotel um, from the, the newspapers at the time. And then um, moving on from that then is um, another uh, clip from one of the newspapers at the time. This one comes from 1938, um, an article reporting that the hotel was destroyed in a fire. Um, so that can be interesting to sort of charting the journeys of, of different um, buildings or places and seeing how things changed over time and, and using sort of um, the newspaper archives as a resource for that. Next, we have a photo of Burroughs Art Galleries in Church Street. Um, this is quite an interesting view as well. Um, lovely signage um, attached to the building. Um, again, um, you're able to zoom in then, you know, on the, the characters in this particular photograph. So we've got two men um, just to the left hand side of the photograph and then potentially maybe um, the owners then at the front of the building. And then being able to zoom in to the windows, you can see some of the wares um, that were, were sold um, in, in the shop. And then again, contrasting that with some of the material you can find in the um, newspapers at the time. Um, this is an article from 1929, and it provides an indication of um, what Burroughs sold. So um, quite a lot of furniture, Sheridan, Chippendale and the like, as well as paintings, jewellery, um, china, all that kind of thing. So and finest cut glass, one of the best in Ireland. So that gives a bit more information as to things that sold in, in the shop and kind of corroborates what you can see in the windows from the photograph. Uh, next, we've got a photograph of the Gulf Pavilion in Antrim. Um, I understand from my talk um, that I gave to Antrim and District Historical Society that it's still there today. I wasn't sure if it was, but apparently it is. Um, so that's nice to hear you know, some of these older buildings you know, being um, preserved and still um, uh, in situ um, in the landscape. Um, next is um, a photo of a forge at Antrim. Um, and this is particularly nice because you can see the lovely horseshoe shaped entrance in this particular building um, and the blacksmith working at his anvil. Um, so very atmospheric shots um, that he captures um, of you know, a blacksmith at work. And um, you can see a couple of other um, either customers or, or, or co-workers um, looking out um, as well um, of, of the entrance. And something that's quite nice, um, uh, what we can do at the Folk Museum then is, is kind of compare and contrast and utilise the photographs too um, to help inform what we do on site. So um, the Ulster Folk Museum is an outdoor museum um, primarily. So um, as I mentioned, we have over 50 exhibit buildings. So you can see there where you know some photographs from the Green Collection, for example, can be very useful uh, reference points to help inform um, how we present um, the exhibit buildings and um, the types of clothing that the demonstrators wear. Um, we're very lucky at the Folk Museum that we do have a dedicated member of staff and she um, produces all of the costume that the visitor guides and demonstrators wear. Um, and she takes inspiration, you know, from historic records and photographs and things like that. 
Um, so I'm sure she probably did uh, refer to the green collection when um, you know drawing up the the design for the clothing that the blacksmith um, wears on site. Um, so that's just a nice reference point there. Uh, next, we've got a photograph of the 12th of July celebrations in Antrim Town in 1931. Um, so this is an example of one of the photographs which contains specific date, um, which is, is, is useful. Um, we can also see um, from the photograph when you zoom in, um, uh, well, on the bottom as well there, you'll see that it's got the, the, the lodge number um, of the Orange Lodge at 651. And on the left, um, if you zoom in a bit, you can see um, there's a grocer, tea rooms and confectioner um, on the left hand side. Um, so again, interesting to compare and contrast some of the photographs in terms of um, what people are wearing, maybe from an earlier photograph to one say like this from the 1930s, um, as well as looking at the various regalia that the orange men are wearing, some of the instruments that they're playing um, as well as the banner um, that they have here. Um, so lots again to, to in, investigate um, in this particular photograph. Um, here we've got a photograph of Antrim Round Tower um, built around the 10th century. Um, it's a 28 meter structure, which once served as a bell tower for a former early Christian monastery. So quite often you'll find um, that Green is interested in um, uh, ecclesiastical sites, uh, religious sites, um, archaeological sites and things like that. So they feature quite heavily um, in, in the collection. Um, and again, here's an example, I think, of at least one or two, maybe one uh, boy there in front of the, the tower for scale, uh, possibly his son. Um, and that's um, sort of a useful reference point in terms of getting the idea of the size of something, you know, having something smaller to compare it against. Next, we have a photograph of the Great Fort of Antrim, which I think is a very um, atmospheric and um, uh, impactful photograph um, with the trees and um, sort of the shape of the fort um, and the height of it and things like that. And next, um, we've got um, a few photographs of Antrim Castle, um, starting with the Barbican Gate Lodge. And again, um, there's a number of people in this photograph useful again for scale and also getting to see what they they, they wore. Um, if you compare this one, for example, with um, the one we saw from the Orange Hall, um, looking at what the people are wearing, it suggests that this was taken um, some years earlier than the Orange Hall, Orange uh, Parade photograph from the 1930s. Um, and again, just an interesting photograph, you know, the, the Barbican Gate and then being able to compare and contrast that with um, what's there today. Um, here we've got um, a view of the castle and the river, which is quite nice. And then another one, um, a view of the Antrim Castle from the old bridge. So um, looking at a different view of, of the same uh, structure. The next place um, I'm going to take a look at is Tomb, um, which isn't too far from Antrim. Um, in the general area. Uh, Green took a lot of photographs of Tim, um, including some which are of much significance to the Ulster Folk Museum, so um, I could not um, include these in this evening's uh, talk. Um, so here we've got a couple of photographs of a man and a boy threshing corn with flails in order to separate the grains from their husks. Um, so this is interesting, showing sort of a process um, being undertaken taken, um, and showing people at work um, carrying out a specific task. Um, here we've got a man reaping or cutting the corn with a toothed sickle. And again, usually Green will include a bit of a description underneath to say what um, act is actually being carried out. Um, so again, this is a very useful photograph for us um, in terms of our collections because we would have um, sickles in our collection for example and then we can compare and contrast them with you know the photographs of the time um, which is it's nice to be able to do. Um, the next photograph um, is, is quite a famous one 
um, showing uh, the cutting of the last sheaf, um, an old custom at harvest time. Um, I believe the photographer of Green is on the right hand side observing the practice. Um, and this was um, quite a commonplace tradition at one time in Ulster, um, where uh, a sort of game was played, if you like, um, where uh, people tried to cut the last sheaf. Um, and whoever was successful then uh, got to keep the last sheaf and um, include it uh, as part of a um, a dinner or a, a, a luncheon um, called uh, the Harvest Home. And you'll see there the last sheaf hung up over the, the table. Um, quite frequently, um, it was kept in the home till the following year for good luck for the next harvest. Um, so it's quite a an old tradition and something that is quite hard to find, um, you know, photographic references for. So things like this, um, I mention it a bit later on, but I'll say it here where um, there is an argument to be had that some of Green's photographs are quite staged, um, where he's showing a process occurring. Um, but for me, um, I, I think it's, it's better to have a record of it than none. So I appreciate the fact that he took the time to document these activities that were happening, albeit maybe in a slightly structured way. Um, but it helps to kind of make the point of something that um, otherwise may well have been lost in terms of the photographic record. Whilst we may have some written evidence of this particular practice taking place, having photographs like this really does help um, to bring, bring it to life. The next photograph we have here um, is of a woman and a boy counting the eggs for harvest. Um, and here you can't help but miss um, or can't help uh, see here the, the roped haystack behind. So again, quite a um, engaging shot here um, of, of this uh, lady counting the eggs and um, the lovely sort of uh, background um, to that in this particular photograph. Next, we see here uh, a man sowing flax um, in the field. Um, and you can see there some of the workers um, behind him bending down, quite backbreaking work. Um, and the horses there in the background. So uh, lots of um, interesting uh, sort of activity taking place in this particular photograph. Again, you know, possibly and most likely staged to a degree, um, but uh, very useful um, for us um, looking at you know, farming practices and things like that. And here um, we've got um, spreading the flax here um, in this particular photograph, um, which again, um, again, possibly slightly staged, but again, making the point of, of sort of the, the backbreaking activities involved in carrying out some of these particular tasks. Um, next, we have um, a photograph of flax being stripped or put into bundles. Um, in this, we've got a, a man and a woman carrying out this task. And next, we have um, a woman scotching flax by hand. And you can see the process being carried out there um, of her using the edge of a knife um, to scrape along the fibres and pulling pieces of the stalk um, away. And then this is a process that's repeated then until the stalk's being removed and the flax is smooth and silky. So again, um, demonstrating this um, practice um, through a photograph. Um, and it's useful as well to see the clothes that they're wearing, how they're styling their hair and things like that. Um, lots, again, useful information for us and even um, small pieces of furniture um, like the stools and things like that, and the spinning wheels. Next, we have a couple of images of um, digging band clay at Grant's factory. So you can see there um, the process being carried out of um, the clay being dug and um, the use of the little wooden wheelbarrow there um, to collect um, the clay, um, which is um, quite, again, an atmospheric shot with the um, the clothes that they're wearing and the hats and the implements they're using and things like that. And then this is quite impressive showing um, the, the clay then all stacked to dry 
Um, and these types of shots, we'll see a few more later on, um, not with clay, but with other resources. And you'll see then um, he does seem to quite like to get these quite impactful shots um, of you know, a task and sort of the, the outcome of the task um, being quite um, uh, notable. Here's another um, photograph that we use quite a lot at the Folk Museum, um, making St. Bridget's crosses of straw in Tum. Um, and again, um, we, we draw upon this quite a lot um, around St. Bridget's Day, um, and it's a useful resource um, for our visitor guides um, to show them how um, St. Bridget's crosses were, were made. Um, and there's a few others um, here where um, you can see there um, uh, St. Bridget's cross in the middle with some harvest bows around it. Um, and again, just interesting to see how it was made and its shape and its construction and things like that. And then just to compare that then with um, a St. Bridget's cross from our collection, um, which is currently on display um, in an exhibition at the Ulster American Folk Park um, in Oma. Um, so it's nice to be able then to sort of see the the um, the links made between um, an object in our collection, um, photographs in our archive, and then also um, we have a large um, library and paper archive connected to the Folk Museum. And again, in those collections, we're able to find people talking about St. Bridget's Day and how they made St. Bridget's crosses and things like that. So there's um, a very nice sort of link between all of the different collections that we hold um, all around just, just one object, um, such as St. Bridget's Cross. Next, we have some images relating to um, fishing, um, with Loch Ness obviously being um, a key uh, natural resource. So we've got here eel weirs at Tim, um, which was part of a series. There's quite a number of these. Um, you can sort of chart you know, the different um, series of progressions, really. Um, the next one here is um, eel fishers unloading the catch at Tum, um, which is quite a lovely image, actually, because you can see all the eels in the box there, you know, getting um, unloaded um, onto the side. Um, next, we've got one of sorting the eels in the tanks. And again, you know, using the, the nets there and you can see um, sort of the process um, taking place before, before your eyes. And here we have um, the eels being packed um, for shipment in Tum. And again, I'm sure if you zoom in closely um, to um, the crates at the back, um, we'll be able to see um, the name of maybe um, whoever they're supplying or something like that. So that's something to keep an eye out for too. Um, and again, getting an idea of, of what they wore. Um, it's interesting sometimes to compare and contrast between different trades and the outfits um, and the uniforms, for example, that people wore for different tasks. Um, so that's useful to see um, in this particular photograph. Um, next, um, we've got here a, a county Antrim cottage and a turf stack in Tum. So again, the idea of scale, like we've seen with the clay here, we can see it with the turf stack. Um, these massive um, stacks that people in good times were able to uh, to, to build up for themselves um, and again sort of seeing a wee bit posed here of this this man with his with his um, little cart and um, uh, you can just sort of see the condition of his the building in, um, in terms of the thatch and um, the masonry and things like that and um, so again a very interesting photograph and then uh, moving on then to some uh, religious sites. And um, this is um, the Roman Catholic Church at Tum, where we see here Green has taken a photograph of the exterior and then the interior. Um, so that's beneficial sometimes in his photographs where we not only get an exterior of a building, we get to see inside it. Um, and, and that can be a, a useful resource um, for anyone uh, researching um, religious buildings and things like that. Moving on then to Randallstown. Um, here we, we've got a view of Randallstown from the viaduct. Um, so it gives you an idea of you know, the, the size of Randallstown, um, quite relatively small. 
um, and the buildings that it comprised of. And then another um, photograph of the county bridge and the viaduct. And again, looking at the, the skill that went into creating um, these structures um, and things like that can be drawn upon. And then here we've got um, the River Main um, and Randallstown Bleach Works um, in the distance there, um, using obviously the, the, the water as, as a main resource for that. Um, so again, um, this is quite um, an interesting photograph looking at some of the um, the jobs that people would have potentially done in Randallstown, uh, the bleach works being a source of employment for them and things like that. Um, here we have um, a photograph of New Street in Randallstown. Um, and again, um, I think uh, Green's car um, is visible in this particular photograph. Um, I think this is one where I've zoomed in on, if I'm not mistaken, on the next slide. So it kind of gives you an idea of you know, the detail that you can, can look um, at um, if you do zoom in. Um, I think it's the next one actually I've done this. Um, another view of uh, New Street um, taken from N or, or the North, I presume. And then I think it's this one I've zoomed in. So when you do zoom in on collections online, you can get quite a lot of detail in terms of um, the names of different businesses. Uh, close up uh, views of what people wore, number plates, details of cars and things like that. Um, so it is worth um, doing that um, when you are looking at these photographs on collections online using the Zoom feature because um, they are digitised to um, a decent standard. So um, it's useful then to be able to do that um, to look for further details in the photographs. Another one here um, of Main Street, again, I think the photographer's um, car um, is taken centre stage here. Um, and looking again um, on either side of the street in terms of the different businesses and the architecture and things like that. Uh, next, we've got um, a photograph of the Masonic Hall in Randallstown. Um, interesting to see the architecture of the hall. Um, and um, you can get an idea of when it was built. Um, sometimes you'll see you know, the date in front of the buildings, things like that. Also interesting to see um, the boundary walls and um, uh, the gates and things like that, how they were constructed, um, useful to see. Uh, between Antrim and Randallstown, we've got Shane's Castle. Um, here's a, a wide shot of it. Um, there's quite a lot of these um, photographs um, in the collection of um, this particular area. Um, so th this is just a few of them really. Um, here we've got one from the battery. Um, and you can see there someone resting up against a cannon, um, sort of looking towards um, the structures there. Um, and you can see sort of the impact that the foliage has had um, on the building. Um, with it creeping up over the windows and things like that, just um, interesting to take a look at. And then another view here, again, you can see the foliage creeping round. Um, this is of the, the Banshee Tower at Shane's Castle. Um, so again, uh, quite often um, we can compare and contrast um, photographs in the collection with archival materials. So it, may well be that either within our um, uh, written records or our sound recording with large and um, sort of sound recording collection at the Folk Museum. Uh, it may well be then that we have people talking about the Banshee Tower at Shane's Castle and then it's really useful then to have um, photographic evidence of that here and then using that um, to help tell the story a bit further. And this one um, it's showing the vaults at Shane's Castle, so getting a bit closer up um, and, and underneath and um, taking the, um, this sort of particular view, um, quite a lot of light and shade in this particular image. Um, again, another atmospheric one. And here we've got um, another view uh, with this massive um, tree um, and uh, a man with his dog. Um, and again, using the idea of scale um, in a photograph um, can sort of 
give this perspective um, of sort of something smaller, like the dog against the, the large um, tree, which takes up um, the vast majority of this particular photograph. And again, sort of looking at the, the shadows and things created by the tree um, is a nice um, touch. Moving on then uh, farther south to Crumlin. And um, this first view, we can see Crumlin from the bridge. And it looks like he's um, attracted a bit of, of a crowd with this photograph with um, quite a lot of children. Uh, maybe coming out to see what he was doing and then agreeing maybe to pose for a photograph. Um, so you can see them all lined up here, um, which is quite a nice uh, photograph. Um, the thoughts of um, the children there and, and um, the lovely um, uh, Pacnum Memorial, as it's called, um, which you can see here. Um, you can zoom in again, collections online um, to see the, the wording of the, the plaque. Um, so it, it does read that it was um, erected by the friends of the Reverend Arthur H. Packnam, JP of Langford Lodge to commemorate his many acts of kindness and generosity in 1897. And it's still there today. Um, and again, um, the photographers utilised um, a couple of children, this time a few girls um, in this particular photograph to give an idea of um, the, the size of the memorial. Um, and it is nice when there are examples of some of these structures as say still you know in the landscape today farther then on into the town um you can see the memorial in the distance there um in uh, crumlin and again we've got um a few uh, people on the street uh some looking out of uh, houses and businesses and things like that um and being able to see the different uh architecture of the buildings is really useful in terms of the different windows and doors and how people painted or didn't um their um their houses and their their buildings too um again another lovely shot um the next uh, image we have is of the presbyterian church in Crumlin. and again i haven't included it in this particular um presentation but uh, when you do do um, a Google uh, Maps search, you can find it. Um, it's still there today. And again, it's just interesting to see what's changed or what hasn't um, with the building in terms of maybe its windows or the little shutters and things like that, um, or the buildings around it and things. So uh, lots of useful insights from, from one photograph can still be made from it. And then uh, here we have Langford Lodge in Crumlin. Um, it was sold to the Air Ministry during the Second World War and um, an airfield was opened on the site um, and it later served as um, Northern Ireland Base Command for the US troops. Um, unfortunately, this house is now gone. Um, here is the pagoda at Langford Lodge, a nice little structure, again, presumably gone if the house is gone. And then this lovely terrace um, at Langford Lodge. Um, really quite reminiscent of some of the uh, National Trust buildings that we still have here um, in, in Northern Ireland, thinking along the lines of, of Mount Stewart and the like. You know, some comparisons can be made potentially with the the gardens there and some of um, the, the photograph that parts of the photograph we can see in this um, particular view. Uh, heading on then to Donny Gore. Um, here we've got the moat and the church. Um, again, another sort of religious building, religious site, um, uh, and again, just sort of contrasting it maybe with the, the, the house or the cottage you can see there um, to the left-hand side. Um, here's Loch and Moor House in Donegore in County Antrim. Um, it was built in 1798 by Thomas Benjamin Adair. Um, it's since been partially demolished, um, although parts of it um, still remain and again looking at the beautiful gardens that surrounded the house um, a lovely record of those um, and another interesting angle um, in terms of, of the building itself uh, heading on then um, to Denadry um, here we've got Patterson's house um, and if you zoom in you'll see that it's um, basically a garage um, and again 
I haven't done so, but I'm sure um, if we look that up um, around that time period in newspapers, we might be able to find a few advertisements and things like that um, linking to, to Patterson's um, in the newspapers. Parkgate is another location that he took some photographs in. Um, here we can see uh, Parkgate here with some agricultural implements um, outside um, a row of houses. And um, you can see a little motor car there with a couple of ladies in it. And I have zoomed in on this one because I was interested to see um, what they were wearing. Um, and you can see there they're wearing little um, uh, uh, nets or shawls over their hats, presumably to keep um, both their hat and their hair in place. Um, so that was a nice little find. Um, but there's another example there of being able to zoom in and, and really getting to see quite a lot of detail in terms of even um, the house to the left, you can see some floral displays on the windowsills and things like that. And again, looking at the, the condition of the roads at the time um, and comparing them to, to how they are today. Uh, another view here of, of Parkgate um, here um, up from another angle, um, getting in quite a lot of the trees surrounding uh, the street. And then moving on to Muckamore, um, we've got this view of um, from the river um, and showing um, a bridge and again another sort of engineering feat and sort of seeing how uh, people have um, uh, utilised um, and, and adapted you know the areas in which they lived and worked um, can be interesting to see um, and then another view here of Muckamore Bridge um, and again you can sort of see a figure uh, maybe could be Green's wife potentially um, just uh, in front of um, the, the bridge there. Next, we have milking time at Greenmount Agricultural College, um, which is uh, quite a, a fun shot, um, action shot really, of um, lots of cows being milked and um, a few smiley faces in this particular one. Um, and again, looking at what they wore when they were carrying out their work, you know, and comparing and contrasting that with some of the other um, professions we've seen, um, like uh, those who were carrying out the eel fishing and the packing. Um, that can be interesting to see um, what the different things that people wore um, and used to protect their clothes for carrying out specific jobs. Uh, moving on then to Temple Patrick, another um, town, Billy Jean, um Antrim. Uh, here we've got the Andrum Road at Temple Patrick. Uh, again, car visible, a few people. Uh, looks like they're shielding their eyes from the sun. Um, obviously taken on a sunny day and a few people um, behind uh, where the car is um, looking down um, the, the street here. And then another view um, of Temple Patrick. And again, if you zoom in, we'll probably be able to see um, the, the wording on the various signs at the side of that particular building. Um, and interesting there to see sort of the little uh, mounds of, of, of debris and dirt um, to the to the right hand side near where the trees are um, and sort of the a bridge in the distance. And then here we have another view of, um, you can see this one quite clearly, um, Ulster um, House Public Trust uh, Company. And um, again, there's a couple of people um, standing there um, at at the, the entrance, um, the car again visible um, that I presume uh, was Green's and another one in the distance coming um, towards. Uh, another one here um, uh, with Green we know being quite interested in um, archaeological sites and things like that. Um, here we've got a um, boulder of dollarite deposited during the glacial period, Temple Patrick. And um, the photographer there posing alongside it. Um, and again, interesting just to see, you know, what he wore. And he's obviously got um, his boots on there, you know, maybe trek into some of these sites. Some of them may have well have been quite difficult to access, especially with carrying his equipment and things like that. So thankfully his car obviously was a useful resource, but then sometimes maybe he would have had to carry quite a lot of equipment to one location to another, depending on how accessible it was. Uh, this is um, another view of uh, Castle Upton in Temple Patrick, uh, which I believe is still there. Um, 
these types of buildings quite interesting to see the materials used and how they were constructed in terms of their architecture um the, just the shape of the windows and things like that um lots to sort of see in it and again a couple of boys um in this particular photograph another area that green was um photographed quite uh frequently was Loch Ness um, again being quite close to Antrim made sense um, for him to be quite interested in that particular area and here we can see um, somebody cutting down um, willow for basket making at Loch Ness and again using one of the implements there to really you know, cut uh, the down and again just interesting to see what they're wearing how they're positioning their bodies and things like that in the landscape and next we have um uh, lots of willow being stacked, uh, ready for basket weaving. Um, you can see there in the background um, some of the baskets impressively stacked up um, in piles behind. Um, and again, sort of uh, in motion shot um, of a number of uh, workers and then um, getting that idea of sort of original um, natural material and then what it is then made into. And again, the process being demonstrated here um, in front of a basket weaver's workshop um, and a sort of work in progress, really, if you like, um, taking place outside the workshop. And again, photographs like this are really useful to us at the Folk Museum. We have a replica basket weaving shed at the Folk Museum. So photographs like this really do help inform, you know, the structure of certain replica buildings that we have on site. Um, the majority of our buildings are original, but some are replica. And usually they are replicated on um, maybe photographs or could be buildings that we aren't able to move from one location to another um, and that then we create a replica from. So things like this is, is really useful to have as a reference point. Um, here are some contemporary examples of our, our basket weaver, uh, Bob Johnson. Um, extremely talented uh, craftsperson um, and he uh, makes all these lovely uh, baskets um, and basket related um, items uh, on a regular basis at the Folk Museum. So as part of a, a visitor's journey um, to the museum, they meet a number of craftspeople, one of which is the basket maker. Um, we've also seen earlier on the blacksmith um, and we have a number of other demonstrators, including a number of weavers and woodworkers and the like, so um, and printers and so forth. So they're really um, uh, knowledgeable staff members who can tell you a great deal about the specific the specific um, uh, craft that they demonstrate on a daily basis at the museum. So we're very lucky to have them. Another one here of basket weaving. Um, at Loch Ness, um, just showing the different processes there. And it's not uncommon then to see Bob carrying out similar practices then um, at the Folk Museum. Um, so again, a useful kind of reference point for him as well um, and, and how um, these different um, baskets and so forth were made. And another shot here of um, the baskets all stacked up and you're getting really... Um, good idea of the, in the scale of production here um, and how um, uh, popular potato baskets were with potatoes being a, a staple in people's diets and um, you can see there a dog lounging out uh, not getting involved in all the, the hard work really um, while the, the man there looks to be securing them in, in, in their, um, their rows. Another one again, um, this man looks quite proud of his stack, a uh, huge stack of um, baskets there, um, sort of uh, laid out on, on logs, it seems. Um, and again, just interesting to see his attire um, and maybe extra bits of information about you know, where he was working, see sort of the shed behind and things like that. And again, we can compare and contrast them with examples in our collection. So this is a basket, um, again, on display um, in an exhibition at the Folk Park in Oma currently um, from the Folk Museum's collection. And it, it's lovely then to be able to 
to reference these in addition to the, the photographs in the collection that we have. The next series of photographs um, relate to um, uh, pollen fishing. So here we've got drying of the pollen nets and you can sort of see the scale of operation here um, with all the nets um, being hung out to dry. And then here we've got the pollen fishers twisting lines for nets in Loch Ness. And this is a really nice one, I think, in terms of scale. So you can see this gentleman in the foreground here, but then uh, way out in the distance, you can see sort of the length of these nets and the sort of um, the, the work that went into uh, getting the lines twisted um, for, for the nets and things like that. And then here's another lovely one of Loch Ness pollen fishers preparing the nets, um, sort of working side by side. Um, and again, just sort of seeing um, in the far distance you know, how, how big an operation it was. And then another one here of Loch Ness pollen fishers near Crumlin um, in, in their boat. Um, again, just sort of seeing the loch in the distance um, and sort of the getting a real idea of kind of what their, their, their work was like in terms of the different stages they had to go through. Um, Green even went as far um, for those who were particularly interested in photographing the actual pollen or the freshwater herring, herring here, um, given an idea of, of the scale even of those with um, the introduction of a coin next to them uh, to give an idea of scale. Um, so it all kind of interlinks um, with, with the series of photographs that he took. Um, so it helps uh, build a, a wider picture of, of the actual practice. Um, here we've got um, Loch Ness eel fishers pegging the lines. And I think his boots are, are fabulous. You can see um, the detail on them is, is fantastic. And even having zoomed in on that one, but imagine being able to zoom into it and seeing you know, the craftsmanship in, in his, his boots alone. Um, really interesting. And then this one is drying and repairing the eel nets at um, McGeary and Loch Ness. Um, and again, just uh, seeing the height and scale of, of, of some of these um, tasks that they were um, tasked with um, carrying out, um, which again is a nice accompaniment to some of the other photographs we've just seen. And this one here shows an eel fisher's boat um, at Cranfield near Loch Ness, um, a couple of children in that boat and a dog sort of peering over to see what they're up to. And again, that's um, you could probably zoom in there to see the name. I think it's um, A. McCormick Esquire, um, without even zooming in. Um, so again, useful to see maybe names, um, family names and things like that, that then can be a, a starting point for, for more detailed research. Um, and this again can all kind of correlate back um, to buildings at the Folk Museum. Um, this is our row of um, houses from Bally Volan. Um, uh, at Loch Ness. Um, this row contains both a fisherman's house and a basket maker's house. So um, a lot of the photographs we've just seen of basket making and fishing around Loch Ness uh, really help, you know, give a, another sort of uh, layer of interpretation, if you like, um, in relation to, to these um, houses and the people that lived in them. We're very lucky that um, in relation to the, the fisherman's house in particular, we've got oral history accounts of uh, children who lived in them and remember their, their father um, fishing and going out in the lock. So um, again, having some of this uh, visual record as well to complement um, some of the oral histories in the archive um, is something that we're really lucky to have. Um, this is uh, the link um, that I was talking about, um, which allows you to explore the Green Collection. Um, but if you sort of look up um, National Museums and I collections online, you can you can find it um, easy enough from there. Um, but here you can see um, a little blurb, just a short blurb about the collection. And then from that, you can view all 4,000 or so roughly um, photographs in the collection or you can search you know, for specific keywords, you know, if you're interested in a specific place or a specific um, activity, for example, like fishing, you could just search for that and, and, and it comes up that way. 
but I hope um, you've seen through the the small number of photographs from the collection that I've shown this evening that um, Green had a really keen interest in recording the everyday activities of ordinary people, which is great for us at the Folk Museum because that's what we're all about. Um, we're, we're very lucky as well that he photographed um, their customs and traditions, uh, many of which are largely, if not completely, gone now. Um, uh, like the making of St Bridget's crosses and the hanging of the last sheep at harvest. Um, as I have mentioned, some of his photographs have been criticised by some for being too staged or posed. However, um, without them, our visual record of that particular activity or the place um, would, would be severely diminished. Um, his book, his work was published in many books, um, but few publishers at the time acknowledged the photographs. So they may appear in books, but maybe doesn't have you know a, a link then back to, to, to Green. Um, he himself uh, published two series of postcards of his work in his lifetime. Um, so there was one called the Wagtail series, W.A. Green Publisher Belfast, uh, published around 1914. And then W.A. Green Publisher Belfast, um, that was another one. He sometimes also produced paintings and hand-coloured photographs, um, surviving examples of which are quite rare. Um, we know that he retired from taking photographs in mid, around the mid-1930s, um, but continued to supply copies to his customers until the late 1940s. He lived at Dunmore House that we've seen um, until he became a, a patient in Mazarine Hospital, which we've also seen. Um, he died a widower in March 1958 at the age of 88. He's buried um, in the Friends Burial Ground at Balmoral, um, along with his wife and son. Uh, 60 years or so after its acquisition, the collection continues to be one of the most referenced photographic collections held by the Ulster Folk Museum um, and is utilised regularly by both staff and researchers alike. Um, I'll let, uh, move on then to the, just the penultimate slide here. Um, if you've made a note, hopefully, of, of, of the link um, where you can access the, the collection. Uh, I thought I would end with this lovely photograph um, of Green and his wife um, taken at the Kissing Bridge in Lisburn in County Antrim, which I believe is still there today. Um, unfortunately, I didn't include it as part of my talk that I gave to the Antrim and District Historical Society and then people were saying, oh, we would have loved to have seen it. Um, so um, I included it tonight because people were asking, have we got any more photographs, particularly of Breen's wife? Um, so I, I put this one in um, so as not to, not to miss it. Um, what I should say as well, um, at the Lisburn and District Historical Society talk I gave, I was very lucky to meet um, the, the recent uh, new owner of Dunmore House. So um, he uh, made himself known at the end of the talk. People were talking about the fact that the house had recently been put up for sale and they wondered who had bought it. Um, so he sheepishly put his hand up and uh, uh, outed himself and said, yes, it's me. Um, he was there with his mum and um, he reassured everyone that he was taking good care of the house and he was um, going to be um, uh, carrying out some work to it, but with um, the integrity of the house um, sort of to the fore of his mind, which was, was really great news. Um, and as a result, even of, of the talk, um, a, a lady got in touch with me um, at the end of the talk and um, uh, shared me shared some details with me about another photographer's collection um, that um, is held not too far away um, outside of Antrim. Um, and, and offered um, a portion of it to um, the museum. So we've recently acquired some new photographs relating to um, another photographer, um, which will be great once um, we go through the process of quarantining it and so forth, as is the way of the museum. Um, we will then hopefully digitise that collection as well. Um, he was a, a contemporary of Green, so to speak, taking photographs around um, the same period, maybe around a wee bit later in 1920s or so. Um, and uh, so that'll be nice once they're digitised to compare and contrast them with the green collection. Um, so lots come out of even just, you know, one talk, as I say, getting to meet um, the new owner of the Dunmore House and then being able to maybe get an acquisition or two as a result of the talk. So it was a, quite a fruitful one to do. Um, 
but yeah, I hope um, I've given you, as I say, a brief introduction and overview of, of, of the collection. And um, I do encourage you to, to have a look at it yourself um, in your own time online. And if anyone has any questions, either about the collection or the museum um, in more, more general sense, please do um, ask now. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. That was wonderful and, and such a, such an interesting collection and subject matter. Um, we've got a couple of, we've just got time for a couple of questions that have come in. Um, first one was one from one, one of the people listening to you uh, this evening, asking whether you could say something about the initials on the shields of the Antrim Forge photo. Have you been able to identify the landowner with the MF initials? I haven't to date, no. So I, I couldn't say anything about them at present, but yeah, things like that are really useful then as a starting point to look into further, but I haven't on that occasion, but something definitely to look into. And second question from Lynn, who's asking whether, um, are there many images in the green collection illustrating white work embroidery as a cottage industry? I believe there are some. So again, if um, she searches for that um, on collections online, she should be able to come across some. Um, if not in the green collection, um, potentially in other photographic collections that we hold. Um, so if she does do a search for that, um, all being well, um, something will come up of that nature for her. Hey, um, we've just, uh, Claudia's just slipped in a question now. Um, firstly, thanking you for a wonderful talk and then asking, what was the clay used for, for ban clay? I don't know. Um, is, is an honest answer. Um, I came across those photographs quite recently when I was doing the talk for Antrim and District Historical Society and I just thought they were quite interesting so I haven't again investigated that any further um, but they're a useful starting point as I say to further research into that particular um, strand of information. Um, we've got a question here just asking whether um, you know what sort of equipment William was using. Do you have, uh, did he leave any records about what cameras or um, anything that he was using? Um, we do have some um, bits and pieces, if you like, from Dunmore House that sort of came with the collection. So there's a couple of um, bits and pieces, not the full kind of complement of, of the equipment. I believe some of that then was left to his family. Um, and wasn't um, deposited with us, but we maybe have the odd uh, piece of equipment. Um, I wouldn't know the details offhand uh, necessarily, but um, yeah, so I don't think we got a huge deal of it. Um, mm. It was mainly just uh, the glass plate negatives and a few other kind of associated materials. And then I think probably just a final question now. Um, uh, um, you, you mentioned the reference numbers on the photographs and the question is asking whether um, you have any notebooks or day books that record and give the information about the photographs in those along with the negatives? Unfortunately not, no. So um, how the um, photographs are recorded in our database is using the WAG, like say for example they're WAG 3141, um, that's how they're they're documented and um, they're really just documented on the basis of, of the information you see on the images there. So that one, for example, will just say sort of Kissing Bridge Hollywood and then the WAG number, um, it doesn't sort of go beyond that. Um, so that could be, you know, a project for the future, you know, for somebody who's quite interested in the collection, you know, to kind of uh, bulk up the information that we have about the photographs, but no, it didn't come along with it, unfortunately. Um, we were lucky to have recently a PhD student whose um, research focused on the Hogg collection, which is held at the Ulster Museum. So um, projects like that can be really beneficial um, then to, to add more knowledge about particular collections. So she was able to kind of provide a lot more context about the Hogg collection through her research. So potentially in the future, maybe somebody might take this on um, as a, an area of research to explore further. Okay, um, I will just take one final question from Claudia, um, to, who's, who's saying that apart from the harvest meal, um, are there many other interiors within the collection? I believe so, yes. Uh, I, I didn't include just many here just because of the nature of where I was looking, but I do believe there are quite a few interiors. Um, there are over 4,000 photographs, so within that there, there will be a few um, interiors um, within it. Now, I get the impression as well from Green's collection, you see quite a lot of the activities taking place outside. And I wonder, is it because of the light? And maybe it was easier to photograph certain activities outside rather than inside. I'm just surmising, but um, some of those activities that are sort of uh, carried out in front of the house or at the back of the house, you know, potentially traditionally would have been carried out inside and whether he brought them out 
for whatever reason to get a better shot of that. I don't know. Um, but there are some interior views. So again, it's worth kind of looking um, at the collections online um, and searching for things like kitchen or bedroom sometimes pulls out then um, the interior shots versus sort of looking for things like cottage or farmhouse. And that might give you quite a lot more of the exterior views. Um, so you kind of have to be a wee bit crafty when you're searching to see, you know, try and look for what, you know, find what you're looking for through different search terms. Um, but yeah, there, there will definitely be more than what we've seen tonight. Wonderful. Well, well thank you so much. I think it's time you need to bring uh, proceedings to a close. So thank you so much for your time this evening and for, for sharing uh, such a wonderful collection. Uh, it's been really interesting and I'm sure people are going to be clicking on that link to, to explore the collection themselves. And Gilly, thank you so much again for arranging this first of 2024's series of collections talk. Um, it's been a great way to start off the year. So I'm um, looking forward to the next ones and we'll circulate links to the next talk, which will be Jo Gain talking about her work with early daguerreotyping. So um, thank you again, Victoria. Thank you, Gilly, for this evening. And we look forward to seeing you in in the future at future talks good night everyone good night and thank you for doing the links for us and all the technical bits michael thank you very much thank Thanks. you victoria it was lovely very very interesting i've been looking forward to the talk but it was excellent oh, I, think you was, I think he was a very good photographer wasn't he yeah mm -hmm. we're very lucky to have that, that picture of the um uh the forge and the horseshoe mm -hmm. door because, you know, it has details outside and details inside. So mm -hmm. he, was, he was extremely competent, I think. Mm -hmm. I also think that he must have had a camera that had movements on the back of it. So mm -hmm. because on the um, picture of uh, the, uh, oh, what do they call them, the people, uh, uh, the Masonic Hall, it looked as if he's overcompensated a bit because the building looked as if it was going outwards at the top a bit. But, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, basically, he was a very good photographer indeed. And thank you ever so much for going to all this trouble for us. It's lovely. No problem at all. Thank you. Thanks again, then. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. And good night. We're going to end the meeting Bye now. So the recording will be available in a few days.